Okay, so in our last video, we took a look at the basics, the theory of trade, our law of one price, and how that law of one price prevailed, giving us our movement towards our export and our import good. We then saw that this really wasn't a new theory of trade. This was actually just focusing in into our market view of how goods are allocated and how prices are determined. And it all went right back to our Ricardian trade theory, what we looked at at the start, which was our production possibility frontiers and comparative advantage. That is really, this was just another way, another way for us to express the same information. So in this video, we're going to carry on, we're going to be continuing with that, and we're going to be taking a look at, well, really carrying on from this. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be focusing in just on one of these markets, right? So yes, we have this big picture, but we're just going to be looking at this one. We're going to forget the other three, right? Well, really, there's only this one here. There's two markets. This is showing the trade-off between the two, and this is just a bounce line so we can get it to draw nicely. So ultimately, okay, that aside, we're focusing in on one market, just this guy right here. So let's take a look at that, and we'll work at how we calculate surplus, consumer, producer, before versus after, and then we'll work out what happens if we start putting in restrictions on trade, tariffs, etc. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so let's start off by taking a look at just a generic market here. And right, keep in mind, in this case, I'm not going to be doing this mathematically. We've taken a look at the mathematical sides of it. I can still ask you how to solve the actual value of consumer producer surplus. But ideally, if we can work out the geometric shapes, we can break them down into rectangles and rect rectangles and triangles and calculate the areas. So whether we do it just theoretically or mathematically shouldn't ideally shouldn't make a difference. So here we'd have our demand. We then have our upward sloping. We would then have our supply. And given that we're talking about trade, this would truthfully be my domestic supply. We then have at our intersection price point our equilibrium price and our equilibrium quantity. So I'll call that price domestic and my quantity, that's my initial quantity exchanged. In this case here, if we wanted to take a look at our consumer and producer surplus, let's move this guy over here. There we go. We could say, okay, consumer surplus before, producer surplus before, and then we could have social surplus all together. So, okay, initially, my consumer surplus is going to be this triangle here, A. My producer surplus is going to be this triangle here, B, such that together, my social surplus is going to be A plus B. So, initial equilibrium, things are pretty easy. But I'm going to back up. I'm actually going to get rid of that A and B because we're going to complicate this graph and then we'll rework out these geometric areas. But just keep in mind what those are. Okay, let's suppose that we have a situation where we have a, let's say we have a low world price. So the world price is lower than our domestic price. Think about that. If the world price is lower, do we have a comparative advantage in this good? Okay, if the world price is lower, it's because they're better at producing this. They have the advantage. So if they have the advantage, no, we do not have the comparative advantage. Altogether, in this case here, we are a net importer because our quantity demand exceeds our quantity supplied. There's my quantity demanded. There's my quantity supplied. All of a sudden, making me an importer of this good or service. Okay, we now have all of these different triangles and the like as we go through. Now let's go through and label them all. So we would have A, B, C, D, and E. If I wanted to, I could just label all of them F, G, and H. Okay, 
Now we have them all put through. Let's work off, based off of this, our consumer, producer, and social surplus before and after. So, okay, initially, my consumer surplus is below my maximum willingness to pay up until the price that I have to pay. So that is initially I get A here as my consumer surplus. So there we go. We have A as our consumer surplus. From the producer side, well, we have above our willingness to accept all the way up to the quantity we buy and sell below the price we do accept. So that is our producers would have those guys B and E. So, okay, let's write that down. B plus E. Great. Now we liberalize to trade. Well, okay, I guess we should finish. Social surplus would then be A plus B plus E. Okay. Now we liberalize to trade. So now we're going to have our updated consumer, producer, and social surplus. And as we do that, let's start off with the consumer. So for our consumer, I'm just going to get rid of what I had originally called their surplus. I'll get rid of what I originally called the producer surplus. And let's take a look at the update here. So for new consumer surplus, we have below our willingness to pay. Well, I'm not consuming Q anymore. I'm buying extra service or extra good from foreigners. So I'm going all the way out to quantity demanded in this case because I have trade. So all the way below my willingness to pay out to the quantity I buy above the price I do pay. In this case, I get to pay the world price. So in that case there, I get this huge triangle as my consumer surplus. So, okay. Update in this case, what does that give me? That gives me A plus B plus C plus D. So, oh, that D kind of got away from me there, plus D. So what we see is that really our consumer in this case, by liber, um, liberalizing to trade, by moving to free trade, they've captured B from the producer. But also they've captured C and D, which before were just unobtainable, right? That was not part, that was beyond our consumption possibilities. But because of trade, we can now capture these. These are our gains. Okay, on the other side, we have E. Okay, so producer surplus. Producer surplus is everything above our willingness to accept up until the amount we actually produce. So keep in mind, our domestic suppliers are only producing that quantity supplied. So above our willingness to accept to the amount we produce below the price we do accept. So, okay, producers are hit. Yes, they're the importers here. They're hit, they're hurt, they're contracting from this. Their producer surplus falls to just E. Let's keep this all color coordinated. E. So altogether then, if I work out a, what's my new social surplus underneath this trade scenario? Well, I'm going to have A plus B plus C plus D plus E. That is altogether what has happened. We have gained C and D as society. We are better off. This was unobtainable to us before. This level of surplus, this level of total net benefit to society was unobtainable to us. This is kind of our gains from engaging in international trade, right? We've been able to get higher consumption possibilities. So winners, losers, in this case, our consumers win. They're happy. They are much better off. Our producers lose, right? Their, their industry is contracting. They did not have a comparative advantage. Others, foreigners, were better at doing this than they were. So they're losing out. Society on whole? Well, we see that society on whole wins. So consumers win, the greater society wins, producers, they lose out. They're the ones not happy with this. So we see, we see that allocation, that distribution of benefits by engaging in trade policy. Let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at a case where the world price is above our domestic price. So let's back up and take a look at that. 
Okay, so here we have again our domestic market. So we have our domestic amount supplied and our domestic demand for this good or service. And in this case, let's suppose that the world price is somewhere up here. So that is the world price is higher than our domestic price. Again, if we want to think about that, what does that mean about us with our comparative advantage? That is, do we have one in this good or do we not? Well, okay, again, if the fact that we're able to produce this good and sell it for a lower price than the world can means that we are relatively good at making this. So if we're relatively good at making this, we have the comparative advantage, hence why we're going to produce it, right? So in this case here, we would expect that we'll be an exporter. If we work through it, what do I get? Well, I'm going to have my quantity supplied based off my law of one price, my prevailing world price out to my supply curve. And I'm going to have my quantity demanded from this point here, higher price. Well, I don't want to buy as much. My demand falls. The distinction between the two, right? This excess supply in this case, all this extra stuff that I produce is not just waste. We have the world that we can sell it to now. So all of this is my net exports the amount that i sell beyond what i end up buying so my net exports out to the world great so if we take a look at this again what we want to do is we want to compare consumer surplus producer surplus and social surplus before trade versus after trade So let's take a look at that. Again, let's just break these up into our geometric areas. So in this case here, I want to go A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so given the way that I've labeled these guys, initially, what was our consumer surplus at that domestic price, that domestic quantity before we engaged in trade? Our consumer surplus... Well, our consumer surplus was A plus B plus C, right? Keep in mind, how did we get that? Everything below our willingness to pay up until the amount of goods we bought above our actual price, we did pay. So that whole triangle there was my initial consumer surplus. What about my producer? Well, for my producer, Everything above my willingness to accept to the amount of stuff I produce below the price I do accept. So my producer is getting E and F there. E plus F. Before we liberalize the trade, that's it. That's the entirety of it. So my social surplus was A plus B plus C plus E plus F. Okay, so that was my initial case at equilibrium before I liberalized, before I moved to free trade. What happens once I move to free trade? Well, let's get rid of these guys here and let's take a look at the difference. Okay, so as we move to trade, let's start off with our consumer. So with our consumer, that's our demand curve. We're going to be taking a look at below our willingness to pay up until the amount of stuff I buy. Keep in mind at this higher price, I'm going to stop at quantity demanded. Okay, so below my willingness to pay up until the amount of stuff I buy above the price I have to pay. So, okay, in that case there, I have A. Just A, right? That's all that's being earned. What about for my producer? Well, for my producer, I'm looking at above my willingness to accept all the way to the amount of stuff I supply, the amount of stuff I make. So that's all the way out to my quantity supplied uh, below the price I actually accept. So above my willingness to accept all the way out to the amount I produce below the price I do accept. So in this case here, wow, our producers do quite well. They get B plus C plus D plus E plus F. So, okay, again, we see that the producer ends up capturing some from the, con uh, from the consumer. That is, in our case, the producer has captured B and C, right? B and C used to be consumer. That has gone to the producer. This is a reallocation, a redistribution of 
resources of wealth, of surplus, right? So we see the redistributional effects of this trade policy in the case of an export. Altogether, what's our social surplus now? Well, our updated social surplus is A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. That is, altogether, society is better off by this D, right? That was the area that was unobtainable to us before. We could not get to that. So if we work through it, who's our winners? Who's our losers? Consumers are sad, right? They're upset. They're worse off given that we're exporting more goods. They have to pay the higher price. They're not buying as much. Producers, well, they're happier, right? They now get to produce more of this. They get to sell it at a higher price. They're winning all over the place. What about society altogether? Well, even though our consumers lost, our gain to producers was so much greater that our social surplus has increased, so society altogether is better off. So we see in each scenario here, winners and losers. In the case of an import, our consumers are happier because they get to buy cheaper stuff. Producers not happy because they get run out of business. Society better off. In the case of an export, Consumers aren't happy. They now have to pay higher world prices. Producers are making tons of money, right? They're happy. And society overall, better off. So big takeaway with this is we see irrespective of if we are an importer or an exporter of a good or service, we are better off as society by engaging in trade. In the case of an exporter, our producers win. If our producers win, well, they get to hire more people. If they get to hire more people, that's more of you and I with income, with work. What do we can use all that income, all that work for? Well, we can use that to buy more imports. Imports are cheaper, right? In this case here, we're happier because imports are cheaper. We gain in this case here. But the old producers who used to make this good that weren't very good at it, relatively speaking to the world stage, they're worse off, they're not as happy. But again, society wins, society is better off. So surplus analysis on each side. Hopefully you can work through that as well. Hopefully if I give you numbers to work through with this, you'd be able to work through that as well, right? In that case there, if we had numbers, we would have some equation for the demand, some equation for supply, and we'd have to find out the actual area of these triangles that we've just calculated. And right, to find out those areas, say we had to find out this consumer surplus, you would need to know what the base is, so what the quantity demand is. You would need to know, well, the world price would be given to you, and that intercept, so you need to know what this height is. For the producer surplus there, well, you know what the height is, right? Price world to zero. And you need to know what the quantity supplied is to find your base. So you'd have to be able to work through that in order to find out the values, in order to find out altogether what that area is. No different than what we've already done. You're just putting in numbers, finding out areas underneath the curves. Just a different way to think about this. And this is really where I want to enforce the theory is really what the important part is. Being able to shade and identify consumer, producer, social surplus. The theory does not suffice on its own, though. You need the math as the language in which to describe, in which to measure what is happening. So the theory is the big part that will keep you grounded and keep you, okay, what am I actually measuring? What am I determining? The math is the actual application of it. So both parts are needed. Math without theory is garbage. Theory without math is, I wouldn't say it's garbage, but no one would ever ask you to do anything because they would just be able to figure that out themselves. So that's our surplus. Let's finish off now. Well, let's finish off now with taking a look at our trade restrictions and how these get imposed and what these mean. So in the case of a trade restriction, let's take a look at a market. And let's say we have our price... We have our quantity, and so downward sloping, I have my demand, and I have my domestic supply. 
And okay, at equilibrium, we get our domestic price. So that's our price domestic. And we get our domestic quantity exchanged. We'll just call that Q prime. Then all of a sudden, we have a case where our world price is sitting down here. So there's our world price. And based off of that, Woo! You and I get that low price, our quantity demanded spikes. We now get to buy a lot of cheap goods, but oh no, we were not good at making this, right? Maybe this is automobiles. We weren't good at making automobiles. Somebody else in the abroad, somewhere in the globe, was better, had the comparative advantage in making automobiles, so our automobile sector contracted, right? As our automobile sector contracted, we moved along our supply curve at this new lower price. We're not able to make as many automobiles domestically as we once did. So with this sector contracting, quantity produced is down, the amount of people we need to hire in this sector is down. Oh no, we have unemployment. Maybe not good, right? Keep in mind, jobs are not being destroyed, they're being displaced. They will be moved from this sector, which we do not have the comparative advantage in, into our export sector, which we do have the comparative advantage in. But this takes time, right? In the case of when we first put in NAFTA, it took almost a decade for jobs to be reallocated between import and export sectors. So not to say this is painless, not to say there aren't real social costs attached to it, but it will be reallocated. We will reobtain a good outcome. These jobs are not being lost. They're just being displaced. But just the same, let's suppose the outcry for this is so great that the government steps in. Government steps in to protect some of these jobs. We're going to engage in some kind of protectionism to protect the automobile industry. For some reason, these jobs are worth it over other jobs, and we're going to maintain these. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to put in a tariff. And with a tariff, sorry, that's not how you spell tariff, 1R, 2Fs, with a tariff, what we are essentially doing is we are just charging an extra blank amount of money every time we import this good. So, for example, with automobiles, we might put in a $1,000 tariff, meaning, okay, if this world price for a vehicle was $20,000, well, we're saying, great, world price is $20,000. If you want to bring a vehicle into Canada, well, it's going to now go for 20000 plus this 1000 in tax that essentially you have to pay. So that is, we would have our new line, which would be price world plus tariff. So, okay, price world 20000 plus my tariff of 1000 so 21,000 would be that new tariff point. And then based off of this, I would get my new quantity supplied and my new quantity demanded. So keep in mind, typically with protectionism, we're not completely abolishing trade, right? We're not moving right back to our domestic outcome. We're just limiting the impacts of trade. We are saying that was way too big of a shock. This industry all the way down to yellow QS, too much. Instead, we're going to put in a tariff to limit how much our quantity supplied fell by. If our price doesn't fall as much, our quantity demanded doesn't rise as much. So again, our quantity demanded based off the green. Not quite as high, still higher than our domestic, but there we go. In this case here, we get still excess demand. We're still going to have our, ah, uh, sorry, not our exports. Quantity demanded above quantity supplied. We want more of it. We satisfy this excess demand through our imports. 
So, okay, we're still going to be an importer of automobiles. The distinction, the reason we'd put in this protectionist measure is that we now are much less of an importer. Uh, imports, there we go. All right, so our amount of imports has fallen because of this tariff being put into place. But what does this do, right? What does this do to society overall? Are we actually better off by putting in this tariff? Keep in mind the reason why we were importing, the reason why this automobile sector was contracting was because somebody else was better at making cars. Somebody else was better at making automobiles than we were. So by putting in a tariff, we're just propping up an industry that wasn't really efficient, that wasn't really the best at producing this. We're creating a problem and we're just losing out because of it. So let's take a look at how we lose out. We already took a look, free trade, international trade for surplus. Now let's take a look at international trade to protectionism. So if we tried to scale back our free trade into this tariff world. So let's again label our geometric shapes. We'll have quite a bit more in this case. So I'll call that guy A, B, C, D. Keep going through E, F, G, H, I, and J. Oh, quite a bit more geometric shapes happening in this case here. Okay, so what do we have for our before and our after? Let's just scooch over so we can see this. Consumer surplus before, producer surplus before, social surplus before. Okay, so our consumer surplus before, we saw this, we get, we'll shade it in to start and then we'll erase it so that we can not clutter a diagram too much. Below my willingness to pay all the way out to my quantity demanded. So my free trade situation, I was all the way down to here. Across that world price that I'd be able to pay. And I get this massive triangle here as my consumer surplus because I get to buy lots of vehicles for cheap. So massive amounts of consumer surplus. So what is that? That's A plus B plus C plus D plus E, F, G, H, I, right? Everything but J essentially. So I'm just going to go A through I. Right, the only thing I'm missing here is J. Producer surplus. Well, my producers, it's an import, right? They were not very good at making vehicles in relation to the world stage. They got destroyed as we moved to world trade. Their efficiencies, their rather their inefficiencies were called out. They were realized they cannot compete. So as a result, oh, let's change colors. Above my willingness to accept the amount I actually produce below the price I accept. So, okay, J. So oh, let's keep our colors the same there, J. So social surplus altogether would be A through J. Okay, our initial scenario. What happens is I put in a tariff. What happens is I try to protect these producers and put in this tariff. What happens altogether? Well, let's take a look. Let's clean up our diagram here. Okay, so as we put in this protectionary measures, we're going to have our consumer surplus one, producer surplus one, and then our social surplus one. In fact, we actually going to introduce another player here as well. Tariff is just a tax. So anytime we have a tax coming into place, right, this $1,000 that we're charging as a tariff, this is being collected by the government, so we would have our tax revenue. That is our tariff revenue, essentially. So let's take a look at our outcomes of this. Consumers. How are consumers faring? Well, underneath our willingness to pay, all the way out to the amount I actually now buy. So at the tariff price, I now have this quantity demanded, the green one. Above the price that I have to pay, so that new tariff price, and up. So in that case there, what do I have? A, B, C, D. I'm 
my producers. Where's my producer at? Well, my producer, let's highlight that, is above their willingness to accept all the way up to their new amount that they're making, right? Quantity supplied underneath the new tariff. And then all of this area. So in that case, my producer gets E and J. So we see that, okay, the producer, the producer was happy, they gained J. Consumer, well, what did the consumer lose? E, F, G, H, and I. So uh, producer, we can already update this. Producer's happy, consumer's upset, right? Relative to that free trade scenario. What about tax revenue? Well, for our tax revenue, we have to keep in mind, we are collecting, let's use our green for our tax revenue. We are collecting $1,000 per car imported, and we are importing all of this excess demand worth of cars. That is our tax revenue, how much that we're getting all together is 1,000 per car over import number of cars. We would have G and H here as our tax revenue, G and H. So, okay, government wins. They're getting something from this in the form of tax revenue. What happens to our social surplus? What happens altogether in that case? Well, our social surplus is going to be A, B, C, D, E, J, G, H. So A, B, C, uh -huh. Plus D, plus E, plus J, plus G, plus H. A lot going on here. Altogether, are we worse off or are we better off? Well, what happened? We used to, we used to, if you take a look at this little bit here, F. This little bit here, I. These two parts, so F and I, these used to be part of our consumer surplus. They are now not part of here, here, or here. They've just been lost due to this distortion, due to us getting involved in this market. And so in this case here, this is our dead weight loss. This is our loss to society because of the inefficiency, because we decided to try to support artificially this inefficient import market. We've tried to prevent them from completely collapsing for one reason or another. So by putting in these tariffs, we fail to get all the way to that level of surplus, that level of gains from trade that we could have. And by doing so, we lose out as a society. So social surplus altogether falls. So society worse off. Again, ideally you could work out this mathematically as well. We just have geometric shapes. Everything's a triangle or a rectangle. This is a bit more of a complex case. There's a lot of shapes going on here, a lot to calculate. This would be a pretty significant question time-wise to expect someone in the 103 level to work out. That being said, something to be comfortable doing as it may pop up. Maybe unlikely, but it could still happen. So feel comfortable to be able to do this both mathematically as well as just geometrically. So we've taken a look at then, hey, we have gains from trade, right? Boom, there we go. Gains from trade, gains from trade. We saw that if we didn't want to, if we wanted to try to protect our import sector through the use of tariffs, through protectionism, we actually lose out a little bit. Our efficiency falls, we get this dead weight loss, we lose. Let's talk about why. Let's talk about why. And two parts of this. First part, we're going to talk about additional, additional benefits from trade. So some other benefits that we get from trade other than just that surplus that we showed there. So after we get through these additional benefits from trade, we're then going to go and we'll take a look at our, I want to put cases for protectionism. 
And I put in cases in these little uh, quotation marks because, yes, these cases are often upheld as, yes, we need to engage in protectionism. Some of these are legitimate. Some of these, yes, we can make the case sometimes for the benefit of society. Most of these are pretty false, right? Most of these you can look around in the world around you, specifically in politics, and go, wow, that case was made a lot. It's junk. It doesn't actually work. It doesn't actually hold up. So let's take a look at these. First, let's talk about these additional benefits from trade. Our first one is that by engaging in trade, we actually get an increase in our variety of goods, uh, goods and services. Right? Certain things, it's just impractical. The cost to do it domestically is just so great that we would never even bother. Right. Technically, with greenhouse technology and all that, we could domestically grow avocados, coffee here in Canada. But given the environment, given the climate, we would have such a high cost of doing so. We would not have anywhere near a comparative advantage, but we'd have such a high absolute cost even that it just wouldn't make sense to produce it, even if we were only producing and selling domestically. People would just be like, I don't want avocados at that price. Sorry. Right? And so the market wouldn't even materialize. So in this case here, by engaging in trade, we get now access to a larger variety of goods and services that we would never before have access to. Second one is that actually we can have altogether lower costs of production. That is, by being in an export sector, we saw, boom, we jump up into that world price, but then the firms can yet even greater decrease their costs because they can move down their increasing returns, decreasing costs, through their economies of scale, right? So for some firms, they cannot hit that minimum efficient scale in the domestic market. They're stuck in that increasing return zone, that decreasing cost zone. By having a global market available to them, they have such a larger amount of quantity that they're able to produce. By doing so, they get to ramp up production, they get to hit their minimum efficient scale, and by doing so, it allows them to drop their costs. So, second benefit of trade is we get to get to that minimum efficient scale. Third point, well, third point is that we get increased competition. It's often the case where within one specific market, we might only have one or two firms competing. And that's because only those one or two firms can actually exist in the market given how small the market is. There just isn't sufficient demand for additional firms to exist. However, you open up, you liberalize to greater trade, and now globally there is room for additional firms. This additional competition, drives the firms to do better, drives the firms to find new efficiencies, drives the firms to push down their costs and prices. So increased competition, better all around, better efficiencies and better for the consumer with the lower price. So pretty good in that sense too. Next one is we get an increased flow of ideas. Um, ideas or knowledge. Right? And in this case here, we're no longer siloed. We're no longer siloed into just the Canadian way of thinking or the American way of thinking or the Chinese way of thinking. Right, As we start to do business globally, as we start to trade globally, we realize, hey, they had a really good idea in how they were producing. They found a really good way to do that. I can take that now. I can mimic that and export the idea to us. So that we can now increase our efficiency. We can now adopt that technology as it were, right? In that case there, maybe it's a management technique. Maybe it's just a way of producing, still a technology. We can take that and we can now implement it into our own production process. And in this way here, we can build off of each other. We can have this um, synergy effect as one guy gets an idea because of their idea i get my idea which then fuels them for another idea and we get in this case here increasing returns from these ideas so very great good outcome in trade and just having that bigger group that we're dealing with so 
some pretty big additional benefits that we receive from trade. Okay, what about our cases for protectionism? And I'm actually just going to start a new page for this altogether. Okay, so our cases for protectionism. We'll list a few of these and we'll kind of refute most of them, if not all of them, as we go through. So the first case, the first case to have protectionism is our so-called jobs argument. Our jobs argue, argument is, hey, foreign labor is cheaper than our labor. They're going to be doing all of the production. We're going to lose all of our jobs. Well, okay, as we've seen, it's not necessarily about your absolute cost. It's about your opportunity costs, your comparative advantage. Sure, foreign market might be comparatively good in one industry, but not in another. So in that case there, you won't lose your jobs. The jobs are not destroyed. They are simply displaced. We see this argument coming up a lot, especially over the last few years in the USA, where it's, oh no, all of our manufacturing jobs are going to China. All of our manufacturing jobs are going to India, to these lower kind of cost areas where labor is cheaper. Turns out that's not actually true. It turns out if we take a look at certain cases, actually a few cases of where US manufacturing jobs are going, for example, this was a great one early on in Trump's presidency, he went and he saved a Boeing assembly plant and he was going on about how great it was bringing the American jobs back. Mind you, relatively speaking, these Americans were paid less than their Canadian and European counterparts. I bring this up, Canadian European counterparts, because that's actually where the jobs were going. These jobs were actually going to European and Canadian counterparts. They were saved, they were kept in the US because the US had the lower wage. So, question for you then why would a profit maximizing firm like Boeing willfully choose to ship production to Canada and Europe? with high wages versus the US with low wages? Well, the answer to it, right, as we took a look at our long run production is that it's not all about the price of your labor. It is partly to do with your marginal product of labor as well, how much extra output you get for that extra worker you hired. So in Canada, in the US, yes, we had a higher price of labor, but we also had a significantly higher marginal product of labor, such that we were more efficient, we were more productive with each worker we had. So that is, in this case altogether, yes, higher price, but higher marginal product. So this overall term was higher. So we got more output per worker. It was more efficient to use actually this expensive labor. So all of that to say this jobs argument, it doesn't really work for two reasons. A we don't always lose our jobs to low cost labor sources. We are finding that we're losing our jobs more and more to high productivity, high cost labor sources. So, okay, that's garbage in that sense. In the other sense, it's garbage because we never had job destruction to start with. We had job displacement as jobs went away from the contracting import sector towards the expanding export sector. Don't get me wrong, there's pain in this, right? We said before with NAFTA, it took almost a decade for some industries to reorganize. That's a decade of people being unemployed. That's a decade of them trying to find work and not sure what to do, right? That's a real cost. That is a real lousy case for a lot of people in that boat. The solution though is not to say no to trade, right? The solution would be to help those people to assist in that restructuring so that this displacement is short-lived. So jobs argument, I'd say that's a pretty, a pretty straw man argument. I really wouldn't give that one much weight. Second one is this whole national defense argument. The, nas the national defense or national security argument is we need to ensure that we have a large enough steel industry, aluminum industry, automobile industry, space, aeronautics, all of these kind of industries, we need to ensure 
that these industries don't completely collapse for reasons of national security. That in case war were to break out, right, in case war were to break out, we don't want to be stuck uh, importing, that's an R, importing steel, right, importing steel to build our new tanks and importing aluminum to build our new airplanes and all of this and finding out that the person we're importing this from is our enemy. So in the case of national security, in the case of national defense, well, we have an argument made that we need to protect these industries. Same can be said for agriculture, right? In the case of war, in the case of pandemic even, in order to ensure that we have food security, if supply lines were shut down and we could no longer have trade, could we still feed ourselves? Again, in that case there, it's really looking at this worst case scenario, this rare worst case scenario, and saying, hey, we're going to create an inefficiency. We're going to protect our import sectors just in case the worst happens. And we see in the case of pandemics, well, this actually worked out okay, right? Because yes, we had food shortages. Yes, price of food went up as a result, but it wasn't cataclysmic because it wasn't like, oh no, we can't import anything anymore because we did still have our own domestic production. Some countries, this wasn't so much the case. In some countries, there wasn't as much protection of agriculture and they were harder hit. So yes, this national defense argument has merit. The problem with it, it tends to be a good go-to. It tends to be a jump to. And again, just because we're talking about trade, the Americans have been all over this lately. We saw back in 2018, this whole national defense argument come up in the U.S. for a reason to put sanctions, that is tariffs, against Canadian aluminum. And all of this was to protect the U.S. aluminum industry, which was an import industry. And it was this case of national security. That in the case of war, well, they can't trust Canada. Maybe Canada would be their enemy. And so in the case of war, they needed to ensure that they had a domestic aluminum industry that was large enough. You can make your own kind of judge as to whether that's a legitimate argument or not. Okay, next one. Three. Three is going to be our infant, infant industry argument. And the infant industry argument is that we were late to the game. If we could get into this industry, we would have a comparative advantage. We would be the best at this if only we could get in. Unfortunately, we're late to the game. So to get started, to set up, we'd face really high costs up front. Because of these high upfront costs, there's no way we could compete. There's no way we could have a comparative advantage. So in this case here, it's saying, okay, we recognize that. We recognize that we could have a comparative advantage. We recognize that you're late to the game. So if we just protect you to let you get your feet, learn how to walk, learn how to run, you can then compete globally with a comparative advantage. So the idea here is to provide limited protection for a fixed amount of time and then to drop that protectionism and allow it to open into competition. It's actually a really good argument. The problem is it's rarely followed through with. What ends up happening is a company, they get these protections through this infant industry and the government says, okay, we'll give you five years of protectionism to get started. And then after that five years, the tariffs will come down and you are being opened up to the wolves. You either sink or swim. Well, okay, we come up to the five-year mark. The company that is underneath protectionism has huge incentive to say, I just need another five years, right? Because now they get huge profits by operating underneath these protectionist measures. They say, we're almost there. We're going to be ready. We just need a few more years of protectionism. So they lobby the government, lobby the government, lobby the government. Government says, okay, fine, we'll give you another five years. Quit your whining. So another five years. And this continues, 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 such that our infant industries never grow up. That's a problem, right? That's a problem. We're just perpetually subsidizing an industry in that case. There are examples, though, where this has been done exceedingly well. South Korea, for example. 
South Korea engaged in this infant industry protectionist model for a lot of their vehicles, for a lot of their um, software, sorry, not software, hardware manufacturing. And we now see the fruits of that. They put in these protectionist measures and companies were allowed to set up. We saw automobile, Hyundai, Kia. We saw hardware manufacturers like Samsung. They set up and then ruthlessly, as promised, the government ripped down these protectionary measures when they said they would. And it was entirely sink or swim. It was, here come the wolves. Have you been able to mature? Are you able to actually compete? We see great companies that have come out of this that are dominating globally. And we see a lot of companies that you don't even know the name of anymore because they've just disappeared, right? They were maybe hoping that the government would be good and give them a few more years. They weren't quite able to set up in that time. And so they were not able to compete globally. So infant industry, yes, it is a good argument to be made for protectionism, but it needs to be followed through on. It needs to be the case where, yeah, you actually need to drop those protectionist measures when it's time to. A few other ones. Four is unfair trade argument. So in this case, it's saying, hey, over there, the U.S. is subsidizing their industry XYZ. That's unfair. So because their government's subsidizing them, you should subsidize us too, just for the notion of fairness. Um, I find this one hard to kind of swallow because it's like, okay, cool. The Americans are subsidizing industry XYZ, therefore exporting industry XYZ. Maybe this is the corn industry, right? The Americans are subsidizing corn, exporting tons of corn. Yes, Canadian corn producers are hurt. But for all other Canadians, Canadian corn consumers, they now get really super cheap corn thanks to the American taxpayer, right? It's the American taxpayer that's subsidizing that industry. So in that case there, our importers, all of our consumers get to benefit from really cheap corn. So yes, that hurts our producers, but our consumers gain even more. And it's all at the cost of a foreign government on a foreign taxpayer. So this whole unfair trade argument, I find a hard one to swallow for, hey, they're distorting their economy. We should also distort ours. No, no, no. They're distorting their economy. Let's take advantage of that. That's, that's my view on that, at least. Next one, five, would be protection as a bargaining chip. Uh, bargaining chip. That is to use it in kind of other agreements, other treaties that are signed between two countries. Like, hey, we will relax our tariffs on your industry if you do this for us. Or alternatively, if you don't do this, right, if you don't move your ships away, your battleships away from this island of ours, we're going to put tariffs on this good of yours, right? So you can use it as a bargaining chip to kind of get other kind of political or international agreements to be satisfied, right? Hey, if you don't start to tax carbon, if you don't start to take climate change seriously, we're going to start putting tariffs on your goods and services. So we can use it as a political bargaining chip to get treaties to be signed in order to pressure other governments to act the way that the global community might want them to act. So Okay, so far as we go through this, I'd say, yes, kind of, we can make a good case for that, but it has its problems. Yes, we can make a good case for the infant industry, but again, we tend to not let our infants ever grow up. This case, I kind of have a hard time believing that one, so I'm going to put that as a sad face. Bargaining chip, again, we can get political gains from this altogether. So yes, there's a reason for it, but this comes with a social cost. So there's a big cost benefit, political cost benefit analysis that would have to be done with this guy. Last one there, sorry, the jobs argument. I would say straight up, that one's a sad phase. I don't see a case really to be had where this is a good argument to be made. The final one, and I'm going to devote an entire other page to this. The final one 
is that this whole buy local argument. We need protectionism, buy local, buy Canadian goods and services to bought to promote, to support Canadians. Because if you buy imported goods, if you buy foreign goods, you're just giving your money to foreigners, right? And your money's not going to Canadians. Okay, this is a bogus argument, right? And this is a completely bogus argument because it all comes back to the fact that Canadian dollars are only good in Canada, right? Canadian dollars are only good in Canada. So let's take a look at a bit of a walkthrough to really explain this. Let's say we have Toyota, right? So Toyota, Japanese car maker. So we are importing Toyota vehicles. And we'll pretend it's nice and clear cut that it's entirely all Toyotas are imported. Well, so you go and you go and you buy a Toyota. So you get your car and there you go. There's your Toyota. Maybe this is something like a Prius or a Camry or something like that. And in this, you have your money that you are giving to Toyota. But keep in mind, this is Canadian dollars. What is happening to this money? Well, some of this money goes to pay the wages of the salesperson, the staff, the mechanics, all of that at that local shop where you bought your vehicle from. It goes to pay the rent for that shop or the mortgage for that shop, right? All of these local costs. So good chunk of that money goes to pay these local costs, Canadian costs. But then at the end, we have this excess profit. Right, and this is really what people are saying. They're like, oh no, it's this excess profit that's going to be exported back to Japan. And now all of a sudden, because of this, we've thrown this money away to foreigners rather than supporting a Canadian car producer or a Canadian producer altogether. But again, this isn't the case, right? Let's suppose that, yeah, Toyota did want to repatriate all this excess profit. They wanted to take it all of this money from, let's see if I can draw the west coast of Canada here, maybe something like that's Vancouver Island, up here there's Alaska, and then over here we have Japan. So okay, they wanted Japan significantly bigger than Vancouver Island, but not to scale. Let's say they wanted to repatriate all that money. Well, problem is, right, if they want to repatriate it, Canadian dollars are useless in Japan. You cannot use Canadian dollars for anything. So that is, if they want to get these excess profits repatriated, they have to sell these Canadian dollars to buy yen, right? In this case here, they have to sell these Canadian dollars to buy yen. So, okay, they go. There's our money. Oh no, our money's leaving. Yeah. But, okay, what, what happened here? How did it get from dollars to yen? That is, if they're selling Canadian dollars, who's wanting to buy Canadian dollars? Well, somebody, right? There has to be somebody else out there who is wanting to. Let's go switch our colors. There has to be somebody else out there who's wanting to sell yen and wanting to buy Canadian dollars. And why would they want to buy Canadian dollars? They would want to buy Canadian dollars to buy Canadian things, to buy Canadian goods, Canadian vehicles, Canadian agriculture, Canadian stuff. That is, hey, wait a minute. This money that we have thought was leaving Canada because Toyota was repatriating it, never actually leaves. What happens is we're buying Toyota vehicles, Japanese vehicles, because they have the comparative advantage. That money then goes to the Japanese. The Japanese then want Canadian dollars to buy goods that Canada is best at, things that we have a comparative advantage in. So that money goes out, comes back to buy things that we are good at. And that way is there. This money is being used efficiently. So this whole buy local argument comes from this idea that money can leave and that somehow this money just disappears and Canada is hurt because of it. Hopefully through this we can see that's not true. 
This money really doesn't leave because Canadian dollars aren't good anywhere else. It gets transferred into yen. That means somebody else wanted the Canadian dollars and they're using it to buy the stuff that we are good at making. So in the end, it just comes right back to us. So that does us for this video here on our application of trade. Big things, we've taken a look at cases for protectionist measures, why protectionist measures got put into place. I'll put another sad face beside that one. I don't really buy this argument. Just the same, it is a case that is often held up as to why we need protectionist measures. We've taken a look at these cases for imposing protectionism. We took a look at how we would put in protectionism using tariffs. And then we took a look at the actual impact of putting in tariffs on social surplus. We looked at how that impact would have on consumers, on producers, and on society on whole. And hopefully you really got away from that, that society loses by engaging in protectionism. We lose out on the full advantages of free trade. So protectionism, not ideal, versus that free trade alternative, unless a rational case can be made, such as national defense, bargaining chips, or infant industry. Those would be the three that I'd say, yeah, we can make a case for. We can make a case for. Again, a lot of theory going on here. The theory is to, compli or to complicate, to complement the math. It probably complicates it too. You should be able to be comfortable in working through these surplus analysis, either just by identifying it as we did in this example, or similarly by calculating or computing. That'd be the two kind of key words you'd look for. Calculate the consumer surplus given a tariff being put in of X dollars, right? Exact same process as shading it in. We would just have numbers pop up, right? We would have something like, hey, this is our... 25,000 domestic and then price with tariff, price world. It would then have some quantities in this case, and you can just work out base times height, one half base times height, work out your geometric areas. That does us for this video. Any follow up questions, concerns, feel free to post at E2L, feel free to reach out on email. Till next time.